Okay, I, I want to give everybody on the panel the opportunity to ask somebody else on the panel a question, and then we're going to let everybody ask somebody on the panel a question. So first, you guys get the opportunity to, to ask. Anybody want to take it? Thank you, uh, Paul. I appreciate uh, meeting you and talking to you. You, you made a fantastic question, but you made a good statement about you know the Pauls go to Palestine, and it's it's one big circle, and we're all tied into this together. And I talked to the the, the mayor in, in East Palestine and um, about you know what he should do and not do and take care of his residents first. But I did warn him in six months, don't forget all about you. There's a news that you, you need to stay on top of this and take care of your residents, but uh, rail safety is important. And when I went to testify at Congress, like I said, they all take focus on was our response. Not how it happened, why it happened, or blame Conrail, or blame the chemical company. Well, you're just a little, to us, well, you're just a small town mayor, you know, and you, were, you hit the nail right on the head when you said, uh, you know, the federal government just doesn't give a hoot about it. Because I offered to go to, Congress and testifies everything I saw. I was wrapped in the whole thing and they blew me off like a bad day. So um, thank you for the work you're doing. It's really not a question, but and you, and, and you made a great point in that, you know, they, they do hit, you know, if you're a distressed minority town, that's where they want to put it because that's the last pushback they're going to get. And this, that's where you have got to all fight for that because trust me, they will take advantage of it. And trust me, I know that my town is a perfect example of that, so thank you. Can you tell us about some of the, look, the health impacts? Yeah, um, uh, and I was talking about, um, you know, the, I was the assistant fire chief, the fire chief recently uh, came down with a strange thing that's put him in a wheelchair. And we're seeing more with our responders having health issues. We just lost another one. And like I said, as a funeral director, I see, and I work just not one funeral, but the local funeral home. So I see the death certificates. And I've been doing this for 25 years, and I've seen certain cancers rising on the death certificates. And yet when I bring this up, it's, well, it's just the way it is. And no, it's not the way it is. There is a reason why that's happening. And uh, I, we just need the public officials to step up and, you know, whether, to, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on, because it's happened those ways where they just blow you off. And, uh, but I, I, I've seen the health and the residents, some of their illnesses, you made a good point, of, whoever made a good point about, it's long term. You may not see it short term, but that's what I'm like. No one's done a study on the long term of what this affected our residents. Hey, yeah, go get a blood test initially. Well, you got your base readings. Now let's go back and retest these folks and let's see what's happening. And the, well, the chemical company blew me off. They're right near us. Um, Paul's next to Gibbstown. And Tom Railover said, it's not my problem with the chemical company. And like, said, so, yeah, it's like kicking the can down the road. So. The children? The, some of the children. the children, all the children that walk to school. And it would happen right when they were all walking to school. And we have three big schools in our town. And when I said, hey, don't you think we ought to be testing the children? The children are coming up with asthma, a, a higher case of asthma, and other health issues um, that, you know, I, I fully believe it. Okay, they'll show me data, it's not, I really could care less. I see it, on, on, unfortunately, on a personal level. Uh, that. They need to be tested as well, you know, and it's just, I tried to push that, should this happen again? And it did happen, and it'll happen again, that something needs to be in place, the federal government needs to step in here and put, mandate something in place that they just don't write you a big check and go bye-bye. They need to put a, a, a health testing into effect every year, every three years, every five years, so, you know, we understand when these chemicals are released. And there'll be another train wreck, folks. So two weeks later, they have one up in Newark, New Jersey, right after us, you know. Um, there's gonna be a rail that fails. There's gonna be another bridge that fails, uh, whatever the reason may be. But the federal government needs to step in and, and, and uh, the state level as well to mandate and stop playing games because the NPSB issues their reports and I guarantee you 99% of the time it's just a report and nobody acts on it because theirs is just a recommendation. Um, that uh, 
They need to have something that, okay, this is going to start happening and you're going to pay for it and do it. Simple as that. End of story. All right, I'm going to ask Gary one question about the, in each pass, I may talk a lot about headaches and nosebleeds and even even worse situations for kids actually that day. Did that happen in Walsborough? Uh, very much so. But first, it was a huge economical impact. You know, we had restaurants that closed for good. Bonnie just opened it 12 years later, 10 years later. Uh, Dennis' office has closed. We, we lost a lot of business. So there's a huge economical uh, domino effect to that. But yeah, a lot of it, from what I hear from the parents who had the young kids, is there all their kids have all kind of issues and health issues. And most of our people grew up in the town, my age and such, that we didn't have. And look, we lived in a refining and a chemical town. But strange, the headaches, the, 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 the breathing, really. Um, some of the liver issues, um, you know, liver cancers have gone on. Um, so yes, to answer the question, I fear for those young children and people as the years go by, because there is a long-term effect that nobody's telling us about. Um, Paul, you want to talk a little bit about your arrest and why you did it? I thought it was a really good conversation you and I had about almost having the privilege of being able to be arrested, right? Because you know you keep you keep the young folk out, right? You, you and I had this conversation. It's a it's a strategy, right? Who who decides to get arrested? Well. When, as, a, as an educator, I always wanted my students, my kindergarten and first grade students, to do research. And, and when they got upset about something, when they heard about tomatoes that had pesticides on them, it's like, well, we can either, like, I, I won't leave children in despair. It's wrong. And so we, we make a list of what can we do about it. And I feel we, we have the same thing that we can do as adults. Get involved. Every one of us have different circumstances in our lives. So, you know, when I was raising my, my three kids, I got arrested in things like fighting against apartheid, but we knew we were going to get off. It wasn't going to involve a, a, a jail sentence, fighting for daycare uh, funds in New York City. We weren't going to get, the judge pointed us and said, you ladies ought to know better, and he suspended our sentence. But these are kind of arrests where you actually can end up in jail, like Diane has been. Um, and there are just times in our lives when we can and cannot do those sorts of things. And I feel like I can do that now. And, you know, but each of us can play a different role. You know, those of you who are experts on some of these issues of fossil fuels, plastics, hey, you know, we need you with the trial, you know, lending your expertise. Uh, we need people at the picket line. We need people to pack the courts. When we were in Livingston Court, it was virtual. The, 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 the virtual screen was packed, loaded with people. Some of you were on, how many of you were at that? Now, some of you, uh, there were, but there were a lot, a lot of activists from all, New Jersey, especially. And we worked together here in New Jersey, which is great. Okay, full disclosure, my first job was at the Iron Bound Committee Against Toxic Waste, which was a subsidiary of Iron Bound Community Corporation, and I was a direct action organizer, so this woman is after my own heart. And that, that community taught me a lot, and uh, so anyway, now it's time for you to ask questions. So I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna get a couple more mics. Here. <clears throat> My name is Rebecca Mark, and I'm the director of the Institute for Women's Leadership. And I want to thank the Center for Environmental Exposures and Disease for having this incredible conference. Uh, we are going to in sometimes at Rutgers we're so big we don't know what one group is doing and what the other group is doing. So in the spring we're going to have a symposium on feminist climate action 
on March 28th and Friday, and we ask you all to come. And also, this is for Oriana, because there's going to be a lot of young people there, and the work that they're doing, and we're focusing on that. And I'm just very interested in who is in the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, and who you're serving, and what kinds of direct action you're doing. And thank you so much. When is the conference going to be? March 28th at Ludwig, in all day long. And if anybody knows how we can get Jane Fonda to Rutgers, let me know. Um, actually, I have a few people that just met. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So just for some background on the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, we're a 20 plus year old organization. We are run by people of color. Our staff right now, they're all young like me, except for you know, our great executive director, who's older, lots of good stuff in leadership there. But the, the programmatic staff, we're all young people, very passionate about addressing climate change, what does it look like to actually strive for transformative environmental justice um, in all of the ways. Um, so we'd love to, to be at that conference. And then the communities that we serve are mainly black and brown, indigenous, low-income communities across the state of New Jersey that need support. Um, we really are the the technical arm, um, I, in my view, um, for communities. So, however, they need support. We we offer that support. We don't, you know, prescribe any solutions. We don't come in and, and parachute and think, you know, oh, this is what we should do to help you, um, or you know, this is the issue that we see and how we're going to help you. But really, going out into the community, I'm the director of organizing. I can tell you right now, I am up, down, all over the entire state, all the time. I'm going to Cape May County right after this. Um, for a late night session with my community members to really just be on the ground. I go to the monthly meetings all the time, even though it's so far from me and I'm everywhere all the time, but I make the time to be there. I see Sherelle's here in Trenton from Trenton East Collaborative. Um, and uh, that's another partner that I've been working with recently. So really being on the ground, understanding you know what's happening in the communities, how can I offer support resources and just leverage the, the platform and the power that NJJ has as a large statewide nonprofit organization to make sure that we're able to support communities, whether it's fighting against plastics pollution, whether it's anti-incineration, wage justice, um, in Whitesboro, down in Cape May, they're thinking about you know, housing displacement, carry out in Asbury Park, so all the different things. Paulsboro, I have people there as well, so working with them around PFAS and, and all the issues. So I'm everywhere all the time, and we just support communities however you know they need support. All right, and I heard Trent's in the house, Newark's in the house, Jersey City's in the house. Who else is in the house today? Brian from Mama Beach is in the house. Any other communities you want to shout out that you're representing? We'll get to you. We'll get you later. We'll get you later. Um, anybody have a question? Brian Thompson has a question. <laughs> Thank you. Brian Thompson from Beyond Plastics uh, Advisory Board and uh, Mama Beach Environmental Commissioner Mayor. How would you judge the political temperature in Paulsboro now? I know you're not the mayor now, but how do you judge the political temperature vis-a-vis -vis environmental issues now a little bit more than a decade later from that uh, uh, terrible accident? I, 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 I'm sorry to say this, but I, it, it's literally non-existent. Um, um, we were on the map when the big port was coming in and the port went bye-bye to win the port. But um, I, 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 I have to say, that, and I'm, and I'm sorry to say this, that if that train wreck happened tomorrow, not much is different than it was 12 years ago because uh, there's been no follow-up. Uh, and like I said, I, I went to the, a year ago, before I left office, I went to uh, the federal government to push some mandates. To, before, I wanted to get this in place before I left. And um, you know, I got the nods from Senator Booker's, Booker's office. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, we should get you to testify. Blah blah blah. The Federal Railroad Act. And for whatever reason, 
no one's ever called me back. Basically, the eight. So the the political they they seem to not care. And here's the whole thing. We all know. And I said this. And I say this to everybody. And I say it to my fellow firefighters that they need to get to training because it, it's not if it's, it's it's when it's going to happen. And um, you know, the, the whole fortunate thing you didn't see up there was the next seven cars that were hanging over were LPG cars. Had they gone over, you wouldn't be talking to me for one thing, uh, but thousands of people in that town would have been killed instantly uh, with, the, with the, the chlorine gas and the, the mixture and the documents because of uh, LPG burning along with that. So, but I'm sorry to say the response would be the same from a lot of standpoints. And this is where a lot more training, a lot more federal regulations have to be imposed. But uh, as far as the political climate, well, maybe we get a visit from Trump or whoever, whoever, if it happens again. Uh, because that's, you know, it's all about social media and things now. But I'm sorry to say the government has not done enough, whether it's state, federal, county, to make this different if it happens tomorrow. <clears throat> Yeah, and this is a, a rail safety, this is a this is an environmental justice issue, a rail safety issue. And rail safety legislation is also an environmental justice community. Just because of where the trains go through and the, the possible impacts on, on the communities when there are derailments. That's the reason our group has every single year, the weekend after July, the 4th of July, the, the date of the La Magantic, uh, tragedy. We we have we read those names year after year after year, and then elevate the fight for for legislation and and for working with other communities around the country, around the around the continent, actually. So it, I think the rail safety issue should be incorporated into, into EJ fights. Okay, I have a question over here. Thank you, Brian. Mine's easy. I'm uh, Marty Duggan, one of the residents at the uh, Yoshi of Rutgers Environmental and Occupational uh, Medicine. But uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot about you know, health effects and things like that. And those are those things that are like really, really difficult to study. Um, I'm wondering if anybody's tried to make the argument just from the point of view of nuisance. It's a freaking nuisance to have enormous trains going through your town. You know, it's not like that doesn't impact things. Um, there's a reason why in well-to-do communities you don't see enormous landfills, um, you know, or chemical plants or whatever. You can't always prove that maybe it's harmful to health, but it's a nuisance, um, and that does affect the community in, in ways uh, that are a little bit easier and more tangible. Just wondering if anybody's, you know, sort of put forth that. I will only take that first, but open it up to both of you. I think um, just very blatantly, when we look at the, where the infrastructure is at in these black and brown low income communities, they, the nuisance is always the first argument, right? Because these are the people who are living with this infrastructure day in and day out, but unfortunately it's not until you have these huge accidents, which still don't always get enough attention, that I think people really start to pay attention, and that's when you start asking the questions around the health impacts. But I think for the, pe the people who live with this infrastructure, who have to constantly breathe in these toxic gases, they you know they have a particulate matter in their neighborhoods. I know in Camden, where I was doing a lot of work in college, you could see the particulate matter in the air. It's on people's windowsills. It's a huge nuisance. And then, you know, you how do you fight back against something like Kobanto and Down Green World, right? When you were working two and three jobs, you can't make it to your city council meetings. You have your children. These are huge nuisances. Everyone in these communities knows that, but who's actually taking it serious, right? That's why they're cited their zone where they're at. Um, I think it's really <coughs> reframing the narrative around. Yes, they're nuisances, but how do we hold these issues accountable? How do we hold government accountable so that they're not constantly cited in the same communities over and over and over again, where the political will, the power of the community members has been completely taken away, where it doesn't matter if you call it a nuisance or not, if you frame it as that until these big accidents happen, and then you start thinking about, okay, maybe we need to talk about health, or we need to look at what's happening to your bodies. But 
we should have been asking these questions when we were even looking at the zoning and siting to begin with and what these long-term impacts were gonna be. So unfortunately, I think it's, it's a whole systemic <coughs> issue, right? That we have to start addressing from day one and like where, where we're putting these facilities and this infrastructure and who has to look at that day in, day out. Yeah, and, and, and the good thing about the nuisance part, and, and I'll take it a step further, and you know, we have Conrail, and how that works. Um, we have kids walking to school. We ask Conrail to Main Street and to put um, gates in. They said, no, that's a town's expense. Uh, the, the trains would cut off our town. It took many, many years of protest, and my mom would lay in front of the train um, to get an overpass built. So ambulances and fire companies can get to the other side of town. Um, they just, well, if you want it, you have to put it in. Um, the economic and the, the school. I found out the big Catholic school was only uh, 150 yards from that closed because parents did not want to send, it was a regional Catholic school, their kids to Paulsburg because the water's contaminated, the ground is always contaminated. So there's a huge environmental impact, but it's also an economic impact that the, the, these chemical companies, I'll just blow you off and like, well, that, we were giving your people jobs. And, you're talking about going to Louisiana. Yeah, they're getting them areas because those people need jobs. And they know that. These people, these chemical companies know that. And well, you know, we're going to get jobs, but their health is jeopardized. But they're getting jobs, so it's okay. Okay, I'm going to ask, we're going to have one more question. One more question. Hello, I'm Sohea Forgan from the New Jersey Department of Health. I have a question for Diane and Paula specifically. So as people that do direct action or have done direct action, I'd like to know how you would define the nuance between organizing and activism. Because I hear them used interchangeably a lot, but in my mind, I don't think they're quite the same. So I'd like to know what you guys think on that. I have an answer for that, just a real quick one. You can be an activist by yourself, organizers, organize people. You need many, many people. Organizers almost don't talk. An activist gets themselves in the paper. An activist will do something flashy. So it's, a, it's almost like with an organizer, you need leadership. And it's not like you don't organize around direct action organizing. You, you can organize, but an activist can be by themselves. The same time that, um, Diane, and I'm not Diane, I was just doing a presentation. <laughs> the same time that Diane was doing her hunger strike, Mish, I think his name was Mish Schneider in DC, he was doing a lot of hunger strikes to get to the, um, get to the attention of the homelessness in DC. So you could be by yourself. And, and an important, important, essential component of organizing and activism is education. So educational forums like this, uh, sharing the information from a forum like this, getting books out. You've got to read Diane's book, um, The Unreasonable Woman, Diane Wilson. You've got to read it because you, you learn some of the insides of the, the fight. But it's education, activism, and knowing who the targets are. Like Diane Wilson wants to expose this plastic company as a symbol, not just of that plastic company, but all these plastic companies that have the same kinds of irresponsible, evil policies. So, um, you know, here in New Jersey, our fights around the, stopping the fossil fuel uh, power plants and, and so on, those have all been directed at Governor Murphy, who said, I really care about environment, doesn't he? Yeah, I really care about environmental justice. I'll even sign the environmental justice law. Oh great, I'm going to pose with you if you want to watch me sign it. And then why are we fighting to stop the power plant in the iron barn? Why are we fighting to stop all these gas plants? The, the uh, CPV in Woodbridge, the New Jersey Transit one in Kearney. So we, we, we have to elect people who uh, are going to be responsible on these issues, people we can work with on these issues, people we can trust. And, and if we can't trust them, we have to hold them, hold their feet to the fire. We gotta make sure that they uh, keep their promises. Yeah, I just wanna add on to that. 
that because that is all great and I love direct action organizing. Agitation is sometimes a good method. Um, but I, the way I, I think about it too is almost like a scaffolding between organizing and direct action and organizing is like your big kind of at the top. This is all your strategy development, your power mapping, who are your targets. How are you going to move? How is how is your direct action going to then turn into whatever the outcome is that you want? So it's like organizing at the top, and then your direct action is your tactics. That's going to get you to wherever you're trying to go. So if you want to stop these, put these projects, you want to move on whatever you want to move on, you want to hold your elected accountable. You're you're going to organize around your strategy, get your people together, have everyone expressing the same vision and on the same page, and then. Your direct action is your tactics that you're going to lay out whatever that's going to look like right in front of the railroad um, on the railroad tracks not the safest but direct action um you know chaining yourself to the fence whatever that tactic is your direct action will look different depending on who your targets are but the organizing i think for me is big picture at the top of the scaffolding and then as you come down where are you going to go how are you getting to be on the ground that's your tactics your actions Thank you. Great question. I just want to thank everybody. I'm going to give you one minute to give your a closing statement. We are going to take a quick break. Rob has asked us if we can take a quick break. So we're going to um, take a quick break. But we ask everybody to come back like within five minutes or something like that so that we can start our research panel pretty quickly. Closing statement, one minute. I'll, I'll be real quick. Um, each of us has a different role to play. Some of you are, in, are doing the research that's absolutely essential for the rest of us who are doing the organizing, the activism. We need you, whatever kind of work you're doing, wherever you are in your work, we need your participation. And it's different for each of us here in this room, but we're, we all work together. The goal is the same. What Paula said, uh, but I think it's also recognizing, understanding, yes, we're all different, we're sitting in different places, but whatever privilege you have and whatever form that looks like, whatever your platform is, figure out how you can utilize that, bring community with you all the time, just like Carrie said, you shouldn't always be the only one talking all the time, right? There's real people who are living all of this day in and day out who need to amplify what's happening on the ground. So just using your privilege, using your platform, making sure community is always in the room and always with you. That, that's how I do that, at least. I try to encourage everyone to always make sure community is with you at every step of the way. Um, as a per person that's felt the uh, impact personally and professionally, the rail safety is the biggest, one of the biggest things for me. Um, I was stunned to hear that here. On average, there's one every couple of days that a, a train derailment. Most of them happen in some desert or somewhere, or, but it, it's going to happen again. And the thing is, we, we can't make it 100% proof there's human error there is mechanic but let's make it as safe as possible let's do studies on why these derailments are all happening and i guarantee it is because they're not spending the money to correct the issues that they know about jared can you give us the scoop can you give us the scoop about where you're going where you're going to be working on monday oh yeah um, um you know you just can't take the Boy out of Paul's or not the Paul's route or a boy and we were brought up blue collar. So I'm gonna be working for the DED. Um part of it's doing handling stuff in Paulsburg and lower distressed towns like your Salem's and, and things where I lay it on to the DEP, to the EDA, um, where I'm gonna be speaking to mayors on grants and helping them with safety. All of those towns I mentioned have rail cars going through them. Don't fall asleep like we did. Um, so I'll be honored that I'm going to work with the DEP and I'm looking forward to it and, and make the towns better, especially those small towns who don't have big staffs. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay, great. I, I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs>